challenge Marx. Because until someone challenges Marx with a book that's as fat and powerful as Das Kapital, Marxism for the left is the only game in town. The reason we cannot get rid of it is because there's no real alternative. It's not because everybody know, have, have not already seen the holes in the theory or the awful dictatorships that those, that, that ideology has brought from Stalin to Mao to Castro to Pol Pot to, to you, know, you name it, Hugo Chavez. It's just that there's no alternative. You know, not, there's not a coherent conceptual edifice that makes sense of the whole thing. Right? Not only industry, but trade and finance, services to cover many different organizational forms like the franchise. You cannot examine McDonald's unless you examine the organizational form we call the franchise. Do I do that in that book? Of course not. Are there problems with franchising? Of course there are. It's a homogenization. McDonald's, for instance, is promoting the genes of the, Bur of the Burbank potato because everybody who opens a McDonald's franchise everywhere in the world has to sign a contract that says, I'm going to make my french fries with Burbank potato. What does that do to the potato gene pool? Well, it's not pretty. We need variation in the potato gene pool. If you homogenize the gene pool of a monoculture, you simply are opening windows for microorganisms to come in and destroy the entire crop. Natural variation in crops is what allows them to be robust against attacks by microorganisms. You think that you found the best genes and now you're going to clone them all and plant a bunch of clones, well, you might as well, you know, irrigate them with viruses and, and, and bacteria. I mean, you know, it's, it's as crazy as that, right? So I still have to write my political economy. But believe me, it's not going to be as if it was, as if we had to start from scratch. There are all kinds of economists that have been forgotten by history because they were not either right-wing or left-wing. For instance, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. John Kenneth Galbraith is right now forgotten, but he was a very famous person who was alive in the 50s, he was an ambassador in India. Uh, he hung out with generals and so on. He was like a... His books are fantastic. The New Industrial State, Money, Where It Come From, Where It Went. He has a history of money, he has a history of industry. He's the first one, as a matter of fact, way before Brodel, who said that economies of scale were socialist, that it was a planning system, that this had nothing spontaneous about it, nothing of the spontaneous self-organizing order of the market. He called this, in a, in a book called the, the New Industrial State, oh, yeah, he called this the planning system, just to stick it to the Marxists. So we have, and, now, and, and John Kenneth Galbraith is only the most prominent member of the school of economics that, that used to be called the old institutionalist school. It goes back to Bedlam at the end of the 19th century and has a bunch of brilliant people that are totally forgotten or totally neglected. Then comes a new generation after Galbraith, the neo-institutionalists, Oliver Williamson, Douglas North, who are taking institutions, organization into context, they are taking the interaction between firms and government into, 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 into consideration, are designing a completely new view of economics, and we could use them. Do people read them? They don't read them. They are, because they are not one side or the other, they're kind of in the center, they are pragmatists. But we could rescue the work of these people, combining with all the data from, from Brodel, and create something that is really a real challenge, you know, to Marxism, at least from, from the left, right? at least for, for progressive politics. Right-wingers, I don't see how you can convince those people of anything, because, they, you know, they don't really even think. And they're getting dumber and dumber, right, with like the Tea Party, and shriller and shriller. I mean, have, have you noticed <laughs> yesterday, there's always dogs outside uh, Tea Party conventions, that's because Sarah Palin's speech gets so high in tone, you know, she'd be saying, I can see Russia from my back, you know, everybody knows that she's saying yard, but you can't hear it anymore, but dogs can, dogs think it's like a dog whistle or something, and that was another cheap shot, I don't even know where it came from. The point being is that I'm not interested in convincing right-wingers of anything, but I, I am, you know, I, I know that there's still a very strong progressive movement in, this, in, in, in Europe, in the United States, in the third world, in general, that could use a new political economy based on a new ethics, based on a new materialism, and based on a new analysis 
in which you don't think of the capitalist system as a monolithic thing. As long as there's wages, and as long as there's money, and as long as there's commodities, it is the same thing. It is not the same. 